Okay, so we, our lecture is going to be in two parts today. Um, it's here it says uh, more difficult probability problems and then counting techniques. So two different kinds of things for uh, calculating probabilities. The first one is kind of like the most complicated probability problems you'll see in chapter five. But you'll see that what, when I do them, it's just going to be very similar to the stuff we've already done. So we, we already have the tools to do these problems. I've, there's nothing new to teach you. Just here's how you do some more complicated problems. So these are all the formulas we have for probabilities. We have the absolute value formula, which is called the classical method. It's, and you can only use that if all the outcomes are equally likely um, in whatever experiment you're doing. If the outcomes are not all equally likely, this is the empirical method for calculating probabilities. And then we have two formulas for probability of or, two formulas for probability of and, a formula for probability of not, and a formula for probability of at least one. Um, okay, so the point is, this is what we have. So every probability problem, we have to be able to use these somehow. Okay, so we're just going to take a look at a couple of examples, but here's what it says. More complicated probability problems. What do you do when the problem is more complicated? The answer is you rephrase the question. We did an example last class of rephrasing the question, but we're going to get more practice with rephrasing the question. So if the probability problem is more complicated, you want to rephrase the question, and get these words in there. What do I mean by rephrase? You're just gonna read the question and you're gonna say, what does that mean? And you're gonna try to say it another way and hopefully some of these words show up because if the word and, or, or not shows up, then we have formulas that involve those things. Okay, here we go. So example 22. Uh, suppose that a compact disc, a CD that you purchase has 13 tracks. Uh, after listening to the CD, you decide that you like five songs. With the random feature on your CD player, each of the 13 songs is played once in random order. Find the probability that among the first two songs, party says you like both of them. Okay, so CD has a bunch of songs on it, right? Okay, and it says there's 13 songs on there and you like five of them. So five of them you like, there's 13 total. So there's five of them you like, there's eight you don't like, 13 total. And then when you put the CD in the CD player, <clears throat> there's a button, this is random, and it'll just play all 13 songs in in brand, it'll pick an order and it'll play all 13 songs. Okay, that's what it says there. With the random feature on your CD player, each of the 13 songs is played once in random order. Okay. So the CD player is going to play all 13 songs, but now the question doesn't care about all 13 songs. <clears throat> in this question, we care about the first two songs and that's it. Okay. So it says find the probability that among the first two songs, Okay, so that part's a little bit tricky. I know they say we're going to play all 13. We're only focusing on the first two songs. Among the first two songs, you like both of them. That's what the first part says. Part B says, find the probability you like neither of them, neither of which ones of the first two. So you like both of the first two. You like neither of the first two. And then the third question says, you like exactly one of the first two. We'll do part D later. Actually, we're going to skip part D. But okay, let's, let's make this a little bit smaller. All right. So... Um, what we have to do is we have to rephrase the question. We don't have a formula that says probability both, okay? So we have to rephrase the question. What does it mean to like both? We're only looking at two songs, right? The first two songs. If you like both of them, what does it mean about the first song? If you like both, what's the story with the first one that's played? Do you like it or do you not like it? You like it. You like it. So if you like both, it means you like the first. This is how we write that, like the first. And finish my sentence. If you like both, it means you like the first. Finish it. And the second. And you like the second. Okay, so when you get a both problem, it's basically an and problem, but you have to rephrase it to yourself. You have to say the question another way so you realize it's an and question. And I guess I'm gonna use the letter L for like, so we're gonna say let L be the event. that you like the selected song. So I'm gonna use L for like, and then the subscript will tell me which of the two songs we're talking about. Okay, please also don't forget, really don't forget, it's, um, it's worth points, and you're losing points if you don't do it, you're gaining points if you do do it. In a problem where I don't write any letters for events, that's the very first thing you should be writing down. I'm going to use the letter L to stand for the event that you like the song. 
Make sure you also put the word event in there somewhere. So L is the event, you like the selected song. Okay, then the second thing you gotta do is you gotta write down the notation for the question. We already wrote it, you like both, but it says find the probability. Find the probability that among the first two songs, you like both. The notation, because they want us to find a probability, you're gonna put a P, and then like both means like the first and like the second. I had a question um, for the event, like when you have to write the letter representing whatever event. If we, for the same problem, because it has A, B, C, D, E, F, um, if we already write it once, let L be the event that you like the event, or that you like the selected song, do you have to continue to write that for each next problem? No. If you already wrote it? No. That, at least for this example here, that's kind of why I wrote, I left some space at the beginning. But yeah, once you write, so if you write it somewhere on the paper, then I will use it for your entire, for that entire problem. Yeah. Okay. You don't have to rewrite it every single time. No, no, no. Yeah. No. What I like to do is read all the parts of the question and write all the letters I need at the beginning. And then they're all there and I use okay. them for all the parts. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions so far? Okay. So it says find the probably like both of them. So we, got, so we got the letter written, we got the notation written. Okay, and again, this means like the first, and this means like the second. Okay, now it's an and problem. Now we have two and formulas. The one we're gonna use depends on if the events are independent. I need to know if they're independent. Are they independent? I'm gonna write independent, but you're gonna, I need to know, do I put a question mark, do I put a check mark? Are they independent, yes or no? No. No. Okay, you're right. So I'm gonna put a question mark there. Now, uh, if you're confused, then here's a, a way you can think about it. You know how the CD has 13 songs on there? I want you to pretend instead there's a bag. Instead of one CD with 13 songs, I want you to pretend, this is me trying to draw a CD, pretend that there's 13 CDs Okay, I'm not gonna draw them all, that'll take forever. But there's 13 CDs in there. And the CD player, there's the CD player. Uh, well, that's a bad drawing for a CD player. Whatever, here's a box for a CD player. And when the CD player decides to pick a song, it's just basically, imagine it's kind of got a hand. And it's gonna select one of the songs. So instead of thinking of one CD with 13 songs, Pretend there's 13 CDs in a bag and the CD player is going to go pick one and play it. When it's done, it's going to throw the disc away. It's going to pick another one. It's going to play it. The question is, is it picking with replacement or without replacement? Because it says this sentence here, with the random feature on your CD player, each of the 13 songs is played once. In other words, the second song cannot possibly be the same as the first song. Once the first song is played, it will not be played again. That sounds like without replacement. Okay, it's like you're selecting something out of the bag and you're not putting it back. If it's without replacement, not independent. I guess following what I'm saying? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna write independent with question mark there. Okay, so since they're probably not independent, we're gonna use the longer and formula. The longer and formula goes like this. It's gonna be probability of the first times probability of the second given the first. Okay, that's the longer and formula. And now we gotta figure out each of these probabilities. This says find the probability you like the first. When you go to select, to do your first draw, remember there's 13 CDs total. And you, here, maybe I'll write it like this. Okay, so you like five, you like five of the songs, you dislike eight of the songs, and there's a total of 13 songs. So you're drawing from a bag that has these contents here. So when, what is the probability you like the first song? Someone tell me. Five out of 13. Five out of 13, that's right. So remember the bottom is always how many things are in the bag total or how many things are, are in your sample space total. There's 13 songs to select from to total. So 13 on the bottom. And then if I want to find the probability I like it, you have to count how many of them you like, that's five. Five out of 13 for that one. Is everybody with me so far? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
And then uh, for the second probability, um, there's a conditional probability and we're drawing more than once. When you're doing something more than once and you're finding a conditional probability, you have to think about it like this. Because it says probability L2, I want you to imagine the CD player is about to select the second song. So it's already selected the first. This already happened. It selected one that you liked. So the first song that was played was one you liked. It's been removed from the bag and it's not coming back. So this five changes to a four. One of those has been removed and that makes the total change from 13 to 12. And now the CD player, when it goes to select the second song, it's selecting from this new bag over here. And what's the probability if you select from the new bag, you end up getting one you like? What's the answer? Four over 12. Four over 12. And then we're just going to multiply this. But any questions so far? Okay, then you just multiply straight across. Five times four is 20. 13 times 12. Let's see what that is. 13 times 12, 156. And that's the end of the story on part A. Any questions on part A? Can we write the answer as a decimal or do you want it as a fraction? Uh, you can write it as a decimal. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. But just understand when I'm grading, I'm look what am I looking for? Did you write this? Did you write the notation? Did you apply the correct formula? Did you get each number right? But then the very last step, it's got to be right. But yeah, I don't care which way you write it. So every little thing I'm showing you, I want to see every little thing. I know that wasn't your question, but I want to make sure everyone's clear. Okay. But yeah, you, the final answer, fraction, decimal, percent, as long as it's correct. Okay, thank you. Sure. Other questions? Okay, so that's part A. Let's do part B. Find the probability you like neither of them. Again, we don't have a formula for probability neither. So we have to rephrase the question. So what was the question again? It says, find the probability that among the first two songs, you like neither of them. So we have to rephrase that. What does it mean if we like neither of them? What does it mean about the first song? Do we like the first song or no? No. No. If we like neither of them, we don't like the first song. The way you're going to write that, this is, this is the way you write like the first song, because L stands for like. So you do not like the first song, you're going to write a line on top. Okay. Don't ever write an event. When you write down an event, don't ever use the word and, or, or not in your description here. Okay. When we do the problem, we will write this in our notation. Like here we have an and. Okay. And here I have a not. So don't make up a letter for um, the event that you don't like the song. If you did that, I mean, I'm, depending on the, your work, I may not take off points. But what I'm trying to say is don't make up a separate letter for not liking uh, the song. Just use L for like, and then we'll put the line on top to say we do not like the song. Okay. So one more time. If we're looking at the, only the first two songs, and we like neither of them, it means we do not like the first. That's what this says, do not like the first. What else? So if you like neither like of them, the second one. I'm sorry, say it again. You don't like the second one? Okay, now there's a word I need to hear, so let me see this. So if you don't like either of them, it means you don't like the first. What goes here? And? And. It means you don't like the first and you don't like the second. Yeah. Okay, so that's how you rephrase this one. Let me say it one more time. Among the first two songs, if you like neither of them, it means you don't like the first and you don't like the second. So that's how you rephrase it. And now you see it's an and, it's got some knots in there. And then we can go ahead and write down the notation. So now the notation is probability you do not like the first and you do not like the second. All right. So again, it's very important you get the right the notation right. Now again, it's an and problem. There's two and formulas. The one I use depends on if the events are independent. And as I already talked about, this problem is like we're drawing without replacements because all songs are played. You, the second song cannot be the same as the first song, so it's not like you're replacing. So we don't know if they're independent, so use the longer and formula, which is probability of the first. The first is going to have a line on it times the probability of the second 
given the first. But the, the line on top is just notation. It's not going to change too much as far as how to do the problem go, uh, how to do the problem. Um, meaning we're not going to apply another formula or anything. So you apply the AND formula and then we'll figure out these probabilities. Uh, any questions so far? Separate this one out over here. All right. So now, remember, it's like the CD player is drawing out of a bag where you like five songs, you dislike eight songs, and there's 13 total. This one says, find the probability the first song that's selected is one you do not like. Well, the bottom is going to be 13 because there's 13 songs total. And then to find the top, you have to count the ones that you don't like. So what's the top number? Eight. Eight. Yeah. Okay. Now the next one is a conditional probability. So the way that's going to work is, okay, because after the P symbol it says L2, I need you to imagine the CD player is about to select the second song. So it's already selected the first and it's about to select the second. And what happened on the first? This happened. The first song that was selected was one that you didn't like. We removed it because it was selected and it's not going to be put back because we're drawing without replacement. So I need you to imagine this is not the bag we're drawing out of when we go to draw the second song. What happened? We, we removed one we don't like. So this, imagine this eight changes to a seven because one of those has been removed. That makes the total change to 12. And now when we find this probability, um, this is the samples. This is the new bag of songs we're selecting from. What's the probability I select one I don't like from this new bag? Seven over 12. Seven over 12. Yeah. Any questions on that much? Okay, let me erase this bag. And then you just multiply straight across. Just remember, when you're doing conditional probability, you need to see what does the new bag look like. Okay, if you multiply straight across, 7 times 8 is 56. 13 times 12, 156. And that's the answer to that one. Questions? Okay, now, those problems, the part A and part B, are problems like ones we've already done. So this should not be something new. The something new, what I'm calling more complicated probability problems, is part C. So here we go, part C. Find the probability that's like exactly one of them. Let me read the question again. Find the probability that among the first two songs played, you like exactly one of them. All right. This one is not as easy as the other ones. We have to rephrase this. Why is it uh, weird? Because it says exactly one. It doesn't say at least one. If it didn't say exactly and it said at least one, then we have a formula for that, but that's not what it says. Okay, it says exactly one. We have to rephrase it. This will take some time, but once, once we get it, hopefully it'll make sense. Okay. We're looking at the first two songs played. I'm trying to find the probability I like exactly one. I want to rephrase that. What does it mean to like exactly one song? We have to rephrase. So I want to make sure you guys at least understand my question. That's what you should be asking yourself. I need to rephrase and I have to say, what does it mean to like exactly one? I got to say it another way. And I'm hoping to get the words and or not in there. So what does it mean to like exactly one? The, uh, L1 and not L2. Okay, let's write down what you just said. L1 and not L2. So what you just said here is you like the first and you don't like the second. Okay, I agree that if this is the case, if you like the first and you don't like the second, then you like exactly one song. You like one of them, you don't like the other one. Okay, but this is not the only way to like exactly one. That's one way to like exactly one. But if you want to find the probability, if you want to get it right, you're going to have to tell me all the ways that you like exactly one. So there's another way. Can someone tell me the other way? 
You don't like song one, but you like song two? You don't like song one, but you like song two. Now in math, the word but is the same as the word and. Okay, so you gotta say and. So you don't like the first and you like the second. This is, okay, this right here is one way of liking exactly one. Here's another way of liking exactly one. Do you guys agree here? You like one of them, you don't like the other one. You like the second, you don't like the first. That You like exactly one in that situation. And these are the only two situations where you can like exactly one. Remember, when you're going to rephrase it, you want to go one song at a time. Okay, so you're going to say, well, here's what happens on song one, here's what happens on song two. It gets co more complicated because there's more than one situation. But you go, okay, well, one way to like exactly one is if you like the first and you don't like the second. Another way to like exactly is if you do not like the first, you like second. Just go one song at a time. Tell me what happened on the first song, then tell me what happened on the song. Okay, guys, with me on this much. Yeah. Okay. So now we're still not done. It's asking us to find the probability. So I got to put a P here. And I need to know what goes inside there. Okay. So what does it mean to like exactly one? Here's what it means. It means you like the first and you don't like the second. Now there's a word I need. So you like the first and you don't like the second. Or. Or, exactly. Or you do not like the first and you like the second. All right, so that was tough. Okay, but if you understood that, you understood how the word or showed up. The reason why or showed up is because there's two different ways you could like exactly one. Either you this situation or this situation. Everybody following what I'm saying? So, again, to like exactly one, it means either that's the situation, you like the first and you don't like the second, or... You don't like the first and you do like the second. Once you get the notation, it shouldn't be that much of a problem, but that part's hard. Any questions so far? All right. Now, just because there's so much, so many symbols, ands and ors and all that, I'm gonna put uh, an extra set of parentheses around each of those. So this is this parentheses represents one way to like exactly one. There's another way to like exactly one. Either you like exactly one this way or you like exactly one this way. All right, now this is an or question. I know there's ands, we'll deal with the ands later. Since it's an or question, there's two or formulas. The formula you use depends on if the events are disjoint or not. So I need to know if the events are disjoint. So that's my question, disjoint. Yes or no? So I need to know if, if this event and this event are disjoint. Okay, so the way you figure it out is, you know, there's a, a lot of different ways. Is there something in both? Do they overlap? Can they happen at the same time? All these, a lot of different ways to ask, are they disjoint? So here's what I want to know. I want to know if both of them can happen. So is it possible if you just look at the first two songs that are played, Okay, could this happen? Meaning you like the first song and you don't like the second. And also this happen. You don't like the first and you like the second. Can they both happen? No. No. Because if this happens on the left, if you like the first and you don't like the second, then you definitely like the first. If in this situation you like the first then you can't also be in this situation because in this situation, you don't like the first. So you can't like the first and also not like the first. Okay, so they can't both happen. Therefore, they are disjoints. You can put disjoints. You can put a check mark or whatever, disjoint with a check mark. When they're disjoint, use the shorter or formula. The or formula says do probably the first. This whole mess is the first. Probability L1 and L2 with the line on top, plus probability the second, probability not L1 and L2. 
All right. Okay, so that's how you do that one. Now, the next thing is this is an AND probability, and this is another AND probability. We have two AND formulas. The formula you're going to use depends on if the events are independent or not. I don't know if the events are independent or not, because it's like, again, we're drawing without replacement. So this one, we're going to use the longer AND formula. Probability of the first times probability of the second, given the first. Then this plus sign is this plus sign. I'm just carrying it down. And I'll do the same formula for this side here. So to do this one, it's probability of the first times probability of the second given the first. And once you have that, then we can calculate a bunch of probabilities. So we've got four probabilities we've got to calculate. These two are getting multiplied. There's a plus sign in between. Let's go to this one. This is talking about the first draw. Remember, our bag, right? There's five songs we like. There's eight we dislike. And the total is 13. So this is saying we're about to do our first draw. So when I do my first draw, we're drawing out of this bag. What's the probably get one I like? What's the answer? Five out of 13. All right, this one here, because it says probability not L2, it says L2 there, we're about to do our second draw. So I have to go, well, when I do my second draw, what does the bag look like now? And to figure that out, you look at what's after the vertical line, it says L1, what that means is we've already drawn the first uh, song, it was one we liked, and it's been removed. So we have to remove one of the ones we like, so this is a four now, and that makes our total go down to 12. Now, if I draw from this new bag that you're looking over at over there, what's the problem? I get one I don't like. What's the answer? Eight out of 12. Yep. All right. Then, let's go to the next probability, this one. This is back to the first draw. So, if we're back to the first draw, then I'm going to erase this stuff, and we'll go back to having 5 here and 13 here. Again, whatever, since it says L1 right after the P symbol, we're about to draw from our first draw and we're drawing from our full bag. What's the probability I get one I do not like is what that asks. What's the answer? Eight out of 13. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then let's go to this one because this one says probability L2 again. We're about to draw our second time. So the bag is going to change. You read what's after the vertical line to see how it's going to change. It says not L1. That means the first ball, the uh, first ball, the first song we drew is one we don't like. So if this, we've, we've removed one we don't like, and it's not coming back. So this eight turns into a seven. This total turns into a 12. So when the CD player goes to select the second song, it's selecting from this new bag now. What's probably you get one you like? What's the answer? How about I get one I like out of this bag here? Five over 12. Five over 12, yes. All right. Then here you're going to multiply these straight across. And then here you'll multiply them straight across. And then you'll add afterwards. So when you do the multiplying straight across, both of them are 40 over 156. And then you have to add, when you add the denominators, uh, the denominator of the answer is the same as the other ones, and you just add the tops, so you get 80 over 156. And that is the answer to this one. Okay, so this one is the more complicated probability problem. You rephrase it, and this time you rephrased it, it had ands, it had ors, and it had nots, it had all of them in there. But then you just apply the formulas, and then once you get down to this, you know, each probability is a simple probability to find, then you just find them all, and that's it. Any questions on part C? All right. Um, okay, um, part D we're gonna skip, but part D says redo parts A through C, so do it over. If a song can be replayed before all 13 songs are played. Or here it says, for example, you can hear the same song twice in a row. What are they trying to say there? 
With replacement? With replacement, exactly. So part D is like drawing with replacement. And what that means is every single time you do an and probability, you're not going to be writing independent with a question mark. You can, so instead of writing this, you're going to be writing independent with a check mark. And so you use the shorter and formulas, so it won't have any conditional probabilities. So when you redo A through C, so I'll let you do that on your own. But when you redo A through C, um, there'll be no conditional probabilities anywhere. The answers will be different, but the notation, the beginning notation will be the same. Like for this part, this will be the same, this will be the same. But when you get to the next line, the conditions, everything after the vertical line will not be there. And therefore, these numbers will change a little bit. All right. So you guys can do, go do that on your own. Yeah. And again, if you didn't understand why it's with replacement, if the second song can be the same as the first, then that means once the CD player selected the song, it put it back in the bag. So it's possible to select it again. Okay. So it's like part D is like doing exact same thing, but with replacement. So all events are independent. Okay. Uh, example 23. Uh, we're going to do part A. Part B, again, I'll let you do on your own. It's very similar to example 22. Um, here it says, suppose you draw two cards from a standard poker deck. Find the probability the total of the two cards is 20 if the cards are drawn without replacement. So I'll do the without replacement one because that's a little bit harder. And then on your own, you can do part B, which is with replacement. Also, part of the reason I'm doing this problem is to kind of complete the story. You know, um, we did uh, those empirical probabilities. Uh, when, when we do that third day of class. And um, I told you guys what the probability of getting a total of 20 is. It was like 10.26% or something. I don't know, we'll figure it out right now. But I told you it's a little harder to figure out. So I'm gonna wait till later to show you. And now I'm gonna show you so you can see why the answer is what it is. Um, all the other ones from that day, uh, I showed you somewhere else why that probability was what it was. But this one, I just said, ah, here's the answer. Just believe me. But now we're gonna prove it. So. It's like if you play blackjack, what's the probability that you start with a 20? So the two cards they give you is 20. When you play blackjack, you're, it's like you're drawing two cards without replacement. You, they're giving you a card, and then they're not putting it back in the deck. They're giving you another card. And I want to also probably getting a total of 20. So that's the whole question here. We're drawing two cards without replacement from a deck of cards. So it's probably the total is 20. So if we make this smaller here. All right. So you have to rephrase the question again. Okay, what does it mean to get a total of 20? How many cards are we drawing? Two. So you, when you rephrase it and you're drawing more than once, so you just go one draw at a time. What does it mean um, if the cards add up to 20? It means the first card is what? So tell me one card at a time. So just give me a way you can get a total of 20. Give me a way. Two face cards. Two face cards. Okay. Yes. Two face cards. So to be a little bit more clear, you would write down the first card's a face card and the second card is a face card, right? That would make the total 20. Just so you guys remember, um, all the face cards are worth 10. So if you get a face card on the first and on the second card, it's like a 10 and a 10, you get a 20. Okay. So that's definitely one way to write it. And if F stands for face card, okay. Uh, <clears throat> the face cards are the cards that are the jacks, queens, and kings. But also if they're, if they're tens. So the way I'm going to do it, just to make it a little bit less writing, sometimes I'll have students tell me, you know, okay, the first card's a jack of hearts, and the second card's a queen of diamonds. This is totally fine. Except if you do it this way, you're going to be writing a whole lot of different ways. You can get a total of 20. So to, I, I don't want it to be a lot of ways. So the, the easiest way I found to do it is to say the first card has a value of 10 and the second card has a value of 10. Okay, and I'll write this all out better in a minute, but let's just think about it first. So one way to get a total of 20 is if the first card has a value of 10 and the second card has a value of 10. So the first card having a value of 10 means it's any face card or it's a 10. It could be anything, a 10, jack, queen, or king. And the second card, same thing. It could be a 10, jack, queen, or king, any of those. Any 10, any jack, any queen, or any king. Now, that's not the only way to get a total of 20, but that's most of the ways. Uh, someone give me another way you can get a total of 20. A nine and an ace. A nine and an ace. That's right, because we're going to count the aces and 11. But you got to be a little bit more clear because you got to tell me which, what's the first card and what's the second card? So keep that in mind, okay, guys? When you're drawing more than once and you're rephrasing, 
tell me what's happening on the first card, then tell me what's happening on the second card. So can you, can you say by telling me one card at a time what's happening? So the first card is what? A nine and the second card is an ace. Okay, first card is a nine and the second card is an ace. Okay, but then there's another way. Now that you wrote that, there's another way. What's the other way? Um, the first card is an ace and the second card is a nine. And that's all the ways to get a total of 20. Yeah. So here's one way to get a total of 20 where they're both face cards. First card's a face, first card's worth, sorry. First card is worth 10 and the second card is worth 10. Here's another way to get a total of 20 if the first card is a nine and the second card's an ace. And then the other way to get a total of 20 is if the first card's an ace and the second card's a nine. Okay, cool. So it's letting me know what letters I need. So we're gonna let T be the event that the selected card has a value of 10. And again, that means the tens, the jacks, the queens, and the kings. Okay, let's let N be the event that the selected card is a nine and let's let a uh, be the event that's let the card is an ace okay cool so we wrote down the letters for the events now we got to write down the notation so again the probability of getting a total of 20 is the probability that the first card is a value of 10 and the second card is a value of 10 and now i need a very important word Or. Why or? Because there's more than one way. So here's one way, or here's another way, right? So another way is the first card has a value of nine, and the second card has a value is an ace. First card is a nine, and the second card is an ace. Or another way, third way. First card is an ace, and the second one's a nine. And that's all the ways you can get a total of 20. All right, that's how that one goes, the notation anyway. Any questions on the notation? Because that's the hardest part, if you ask me. Uh, the next part might be a little bit hard, but if you don't get the notation, how are you gonna get the rest of it? Any questions on this much? All right, so then, So I know we have these ands, but between the ands, we have the ors. So this is an or problem first. So we have to use or formula. There's two or formulas depending on if the events are disjoint. So I need to know if they're disjoint. We have three nasty events, ugly looking events with ors in between. To see if they're disjoint, you have to look at each pair and see if they're disjoint. So if you draw two cards, I wanna know if it's possible for this to happen and also this to happen. Can they both have a value of 10? And at the same time, the first one is a nine and the second one's an ace. Yes or no? No? No, the answer is no. They can't both happen. If this thing here happens, then they both are worth 10. Then the first one can't be a nine, right? So this one can't happen as well. You're just drawing two cards. You're not gonna draw two cards more than once. You're just drawing two cards. Can they both be worth 10? But also the first card is a nine, second card's an ace, no. They can't both happen. Okay, so then you gotta look at these two. So this one and this one, can they both happen? If you draw two cards, can they both be worth 10? And at the same time, the first one's an ace and the second one's a nine, yes or no? No. No, they cannot happen at the same time. Let's go, now let's look at this pair. You have to look at all pairs. So we'll look at these two now. If you draw two cards from a deck of cards, is it possible the first one's a nine and the second one's an ace, but also the first one's an ace and the second one's a nine? Is that possible? No. No. So no pair can happen at the same time. Therefore, they are disjoints. You're just going to write the word disjoint somewhere above here with a check mark would be good. Okay. And the disjoint formula for or says you do the probability each one separately and you add. So you do probability of each of these parentheses separately and then put a plus sign in between. So it's probably the first plus probability of the second 
plus probability of the third. That's the OR formula. Now we're going to use the AND formula. There's each one of these. We have three probabilities here. Each one is an AND. And the way you figure it out is you have to know if the events are independent or not. And we're drawing without replacements, so we don't know if they're independent. So we're going to use the longer AND formula. It's going to go like this. Probably the first times probability of the second, given the first. Same thing for all of them. Probably the first times probability second, given the first. This one is probably the first times probability second, given the first. All right. Here it says, find the probably the first card you draw is a 10. When you're drawing the first card, you're drawing out of a full deck of cards. There's 52 cards total. And I want to know um, the probability of getting a card that has a value of 10. So you have to count how many cards have a value of 10. How many cards have a value of 10 in a deck of cards? OK. So which cards have a value of 10? The 10s, the jacks, the queens, and the kings. 16. 16. That's right. Four tens, four jacks, four queens, four kings, 16. All right, let's go to this one. It's a conditional probability. This already happened. What does that mean? You've already drawn the first card out of the deck. It had a value of 10. You took it out, and you're leaving it out. Now I'm asking, so probably the next one is a value of 10. First of all, how many cards are in the new deck? 51. 51. And how many tens or cards that have a value of 10 remain in the new deck? 15. That's right. If you've taken one of them out, there's 15 left. That's that one. OK, let's go to this. This is back to a full deck, because it says first draw. On your first draw, you're drawing out of a full deck. What's the probability you get a 9? What's the answer? 4. Tell me the whole answer. 4 out of? 52. 4 out of 52, yes. OK. Then this one, again, this is a conditional probability. And because this is A2, we're about to draw the second card. When you draw the second card, the deck has been modified. It's not the full deck anymore because we removed the nine. So you need to imagine a deck of cards with one nine removed. How many cards are left in the deck total? 51. 51. And now I'm trying to find the probability that I get an ace. How many aces are left in the deck? Four. Four. Okay, don't memorize you subtract one or anything. What happened? We removed the nine. But now I'm counting the aces. There's still four aces. After I remove a nine, all four aces are still there. So it's four out of 51. Any questions on that one? Okay, let's go to this one. They're talking about the first draw. So again, we're drawing out of a full deck. Bottom is 52. And I want to count the aces. How many aces? Four. Okay, so that's four out of 52. All right, now this one, again, this is a conditional probability the deck's gonna change. We're about to draw the second card. So we're not drawing out of a full deck. What does the new deck look like? It's the old deck with one ace removed. I need you to imagine a full deck of 52 cards. You took an ace out, just take it out, and now you have a new deck, and we're drawing from the new deck. The new deck has how many cards total? 51. 51. And since so I'm trying to find the probability of getting a nine, I have to count how many nines are in the new deck. How many? Four. Four. We removed an ace, but we didn't remove a nine, so there's still four nines in there. Yeah. Okay. Then you got to multiply straight across on each of these things. Uh, let me do that real quick. 16 times 15 is 240. 2 times 51, 2, 6, 5, 2. The second one is 16 out of 2652. Third one is 16 out of 2652. And then when you add straight across, the bottom stays the same. Um, it's going to be 272, it looks like, over 272 divided by 2652. And on the calculator, you get it's about 10.26%, which is what I told you it was. Back then. Okay, so that's how you would calculate the probability of getting a total of 20. Okay, that's example 23. Any questions? Okay, so I'm going to skip the part B, which says do it with replacement, so you guys can do that on your own. 
Okay, guys, so, and now we're jumping to section 5.5, which is counting techniques. Now, when it comes to counting techniques, a couple things to tell you. I mean, I have to tell you why do we care about counting techniques, which I'll tell you in a minute. And the second thing I want to tell you is that there's, there's like four or five big counting techniques. But as I said before, I don't, uh, there's not enough time to cover absolutely everything. So I don't cover the other counting techniques. I also don't test you on it and uh, it won't be an online homework or anything, or at least it shouldn't be. Um, so we're just gonna talk about one counting technique today, which is called the multiplication rule for counting. It actually is the most important one because all the other counting techniques come from this one anyway. So, but this is the most important one. So, okay. So just so we're clear, if you're reading section 5.5, um, what we're doing is just a small part of it. We're not going to be doing the rest of it. So it's going to be skipped. All right. So I guess we got to talk about why we need counting techniques. So, okay, here we go. So why do we care about counting techniques? Because the formula we learned last class for finding probabilities, the one, the classical method, this formula. If you're trying to find a probability using this formula, remember, first of all, this is called the classical method. You can't use it every time, but you can use uh, the classical method to find probabilities if all the outcomes of your experiment are equally likely. So if this is the formula you're using, well, what does this mean here? This means count how many things are in event E. Absolute value around an event means count. It means count, okay? And absolute value around a sample space, again, absolute value around any event means count. So that's what you're doing. You have to count how many things are in E, put that answer on top, count how many things are in S, and put it on the bottom. Okay, so you have to count the number of things in E, you have to count the number of things in S. Now, in the problems that we did last time, it was pretty easy to do because the lists were kind of small. You know, E might have like, you know, seven things in there and you just sit there and you count the seven things that are in there. S might have 18 things in there and you just count, you know. So what we want to learn today though, is how do we count these things if they're, if we're not, if we don't want to list them, okay? What if E, event E has, you know, 17,000 things? And you're trying to figure out that it's 17,000 things. You don't want to sit there and list 17,000 things and then count them all. Okay. So the goal, we want to count how many things are in event E and count how many things are in the sample space without actually making the lists um, because the lists are huge. So the big benefit of what we're doing in this section is using this formula to calculate probabilities. And again, the top and bottom of the fraction, we have to count things and we want to count super huge groups of objects without making the list first. Because if I want, if all I want is the probability, I don't need the list. I just want to know how many things are on this list, how many things are on that list. That's the idea. So we're going to learn, we need to learn how to count uh, how many things are in our events when they're big, when there's a lot of things in the events. Okay, so here's how the multiplication rule goes. So there's a group of objects you're trying to count, okay? And the way you, you count them, it goes like this. You first have to ask yourself, if you were gonna build one of the objects, how many steps does it take to build it? Okay, that's the first question you always ask yourself. And then you're gonna put that many blank spaces down. You're gonna put one space for each step it takes to build it. We'll do an example in a second, but let me just get through this. And then above each space, you're gonna write down how many choices you had for that first decision, and then you multiply them all out, and that's going to be um, how many objects you have total. Okay, I know it's not making any sense what I'm saying, so uh, let me do a couple of quick examples here. So let's say you're going to pick an outfit, and you have some shirts, and you have some pants, okay? And let's say you have, um, I won't make up any shirts. Let's say you have two shirts, and you have three pairs of pants, and you're trying to decide what to wear, okay? And all the shirts and pants go together, so you don't care. You're gonna pick just one shirt and one pants and pick an outfit. Okay, if I say count the number of outfits, well, here's how it's gonna go. First of all, in order to build an outfit, how many decisions do you have to make? So that's always the first question. I wanna count outfits. In order to build one, so yeah, that's the question you ask yourself. In order to build one, how many decisions do I have to make? Someone tell me, how many decisions do I have to make? Two. Two. So I'm going to put two blank spaces. These are not fraction lines, they're just blank spaces. 
the first decision you have to decide on is which shirt to pick. And then your second decision is you have to decide what pair of pants to pick. Those are your two decisions. Okay. Then the second thing you do is for each decision, figure out how many choices you have for that decision. So for the shirt decision, how many choices do you have for that? Two. two. You have two choices because there's two shirts you can pick. For the pants decision, how many choices do you have? Three. Three. And so you just multiply these together. That's why it's called the multiplication rule for counting. And after you multiply them together, you find out that there's six outfits that you could make. Okay, and that's it. That's the multiplication rule for counting. Okay, and um, actually just to be a little more, um, let me make up some shirts. Okay, let me say, uh, I don't know. Let's write t-shirt. So let's say t-shirt is one of your options for your shirt. Um, I don't know. Let's write, okay, polo shirt. I, don't, I can't think of anything right now. For pants, let's say you have uh, jeans. And then you have um, slacks. I don't know. And maybe we'll put, um, no. What else could you have? Jeans, slacks. Let's just write like shorts or something like that. So you can see the outfits you can, you can make. You can pick t-shirt and jeans, t-shirt and slacks, t-shirt and shorts, that's three outfits. And the other three are, you know, you could do a polo in jeans, polo in slacks, polo in shirts. So it makes sense, you have six outfits total. But of course that one's pretty easy. You could have just listed the outfits for this one. So let's do another one like this, but where it's a little bit harder to list it. Okay, so one more example. Let's say you're gonna go to an ice cream shop. Okay, let's make it my ice cream shop, okay? So Greg's ice cream shop. So, so I can make things simple. When you come to my ice cream shop, in order to build an ice cream, you have to you get you have to make three decisions basically. So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna decide on the container. You have to have a container. You might say, I don't want a container, put it in my hand or something. But no, 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 you gotta pick a container. And you only have two options for the container, either a cup or a cone. And let's not get crazy. We don't have all sorts of different fancy cones, waffle cones, sprinkle cones, whatever. Just, I have one cup and one type of cone in my shop, okay? And you gotta pick one of those. Then you gotta pick the flavor of the ice cream. I'm not gonna list all the flavors, but like in Baskin Robbins, how many flavors are there at Baskin Robbins? 31. 31, you are wrong. What's the right answer? Does anyone 32? know? 32, yes, you are right. I know, <laughs> see the things you learn in here, you know, you learn things about Baskin Robbins. Ice cream, I'm expert. I'll tell you and teach you anything you want. Um, I know it's called 31 flavors. There's actually 32 flavors. One time I went there and I counted because you know, all the tubs are like in pairs. So it's gotta be an even number and it's 32 flavors. And I asked them, there's 32 flavors here. How come it's called 31 flavors? And the person said, well, we have 31 flavors and then there's one extra one that's like the flavor of the month or something. So every, every month they change it. See how interesting stats is? We get to learn about 31 flavors. Anyway, there's 32 flavors, not a big deal. And then after, so let's just pretend like 31 flavors at my ice cream shop, there's 32 different choices for what uh, ice cream you want. And then uh, you're gonna decide on a topping. You don't want a topping, too bad. You have to have a topping. So my ice cream shop is very strict. You gotta pick a container, you gotta pick a flavor, and you gotta pick a topping. You can't have more than one topping. If you want that, go to Yogurt Land. You can't have it at my shop. You want more than one scoop, you can't. You get one container, one scoop, one topping, and you get out of my shop. I'm just doing that so that we can make all the counting easy. So let's say the toppings are, okay, so I'll make up some toppings. Sprinkles, um, let's say, uh, chocolate syrup, um, whipped cream. Let's just keep it at that. That's all we got at my shop. Okay, so let me say it one more time. In order to build an ice cream at my shop, you're gonna pick one container, one scoop of the ice cream, so one flavor only, and then one topping, and then you've built an ice cream. So now the question is, what's the total number of ice creams? 
that you can build at my shop. So let me ask you this question. This is always the first question you ask when you're counting things. In order to build an ice cream, because I'm asking you to count all the ice creams. In order to build one, how many decisions do you have to make? Three. Three. So you put three blank spaces. Okay. Because you have to decide what the container is that you're gonna choose. Then you have to decide the flavor you want. And then you have to decide the topping. Okay, now we go one decision at a time and count how many ways I can make that decision, how many choices I have for that decision. For the container, how many choices do I have? Two. Two. For the flavor, how many choices do I have? 32. 32. For the topping, how many choices do I have? Three. Three. Yeah. And then it's called the multiplication rule for counting. It then says you multiply these numbers together and that's the total amount of ice creams you can build at my shop. So the answer is 192 ice creams. So see, I don't wanna make that list. That's a lot to list, but we can count how many ice creams can be built total without making the list. That's the multiplication rule for counting. We're gonna do a lot more examples, but any questions so far? Okay, so in these first seven examples, um, I give you an experiment, and I basically ask you to count how many different outcomes there are total. In other words, I'm asking you to count how many things are in the sample space. But what I wanna do first before we count is I wanna list a few outcomes of the experiment so you guys understand what the outcomes look like, and then once you understand what they look like, then we're gonna be able to count them. So for this experiment, it says flip a single coin four times. So I'm gonna write down some outcomes. So some outcomes. Okay, when I ask this in class, a lot of times a student will say, I'll say, I'll say, okay guys, uh, give me one outcome of this and someone will say heads. Um, if you just say heads and you stop, you didn't understand the experiment. If I say you're gonna flip a coin once, then an outcome is something like heads or tails. But here I say you're gonna flip the coin four times. So in order to complete this experiment once, you have to flip the coin four times. And once you flipped it four times, tell me the result, and that's one outcome. So I know it sounds a little weird because you have to say four things in order to give me one outcome. But to do this experiment once, where it says flip a coin four times, you have to flip the coin four times, and that's one outcome. Okay, so for example, an outcome is something like heads, 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 heads. That means all four flips landed on heads. I know it looks like four things, but that's one outcome because this experiment is flipping four times. Another outcome is something like heads, tails, tails, heads. Any sequence of four symbols like that is gonna be an outcome since we're flipping four times. Let me try it one more down, tails, tails, heads, heads. And the list goes on and on. There's lots of outcomes. Okay, now that we understand what the outcomes look like, let's count how many outcomes are there total. And, or another way to say it is, if I was to list all the outcomes of this experiment, how many would there be? So S stands for sample space. I'm going to put an absolute value around it, and that's me asking how many things are in the sample space. So the multiplication rule for counting says the following. If you're trying to count some objects, first think, how many decisions would you have to make to come up with one of the outcomes? So if you look at these outcomes here, like for example, if someone said this to me, I would say, okay, in order to say that to me, you had to make four decisions. I know it's four very simple decisions, but you had to make four decisions. You had to decide what symbol to say first, what symbol to say second, what symbol to say third, and what symbol to say fourth. So it takes four decisions to make that outcome. So first thing you ask yourself, how many decisions does it take to make an outcome? It takes four decisions. So I'm gonna put four blank spaces here. These are not fraction lines, these are blank spaces. Okay. And then what you do is you count how many options you had for each decision. Your first decision was what symbol to say first, and you had four, uh, sorry, how many decisions do you have for that first decision? Well, you can either say heads or tails. So you have two options for how, what to say first. Your second decision is what symbol to say second. How many options do you have for that? Again, it's two because you could either say heads or tails for the second symbol. How many options do you have for the third decision? Two again. How many options for the fourth? Two again. Then once you figure all that out, you multiply all these together 
and that's how many different outcomes you have. So 16. So if I was to continue this list here, I only listed three outcomes. If I would continue the list, there would have been 16 different outcomes of this experiment. Okay, let's try the next one. Okay, so in this experiment, we're gonna flip a coin once, then roll a die. Once again, I wanna write down some outcomes first. So some outcomes. So imagine you did that. Imagine you flip, a, uh, yeah, you flip a coin, then you roll a die. What could happen? Well, the coin could land on heads and the die could land on four, for example. Or give me another outcome. Again, you're gonna flip the coin first, then roll the die. Once you've done that, you've completed this experiment once. So it takes two symbols to tell me what happened when you completed this experiment once. So another example is like tails six. Another example, heads one or heads five and on and on. There's lots of different examples. I won't list them all, but I wanted to list a few so you get an idea of what the outcomes look like. Okay, so then we're gonna count how many things are in the sample space or how many different outcomes there are total. So again, I'll just write it like this, number of things in the sample space. So we're gonna use the multiplication rule for counting. So you have to, have to ask yourself this question. How many decisions do you have to make to give me one outcome? And the answer is you make two decisions because you have to tell me what symbol to say first and then what number to say second. In other words, you gotta tell me what the coin lands on, then you gotta tell me what the die lands on and then you've told me the outcome. So it takes two decisions, so I'm gonna put two blank spaces here. Okay, now, how many choices do you have for the thing you say first? Well, the thing you're gonna say first is either heads or tails, so you have two decisions there. Two options, sorry, for that one decision. Then how many options do you have for the second decision? Well, for the second decision, you're gonna tell me what the die landed on, so you have six options for what you can say. So you put a six here. Then you multiply. Multiplication rule says multiply, and that's how many different outcomes there are of this experiment. So there's 12 outcomes there. So I only listed four, but if you were to list them all, there'd be 12. Hopefully that one makes sense because you can just sit there and list them all. For example, the outcomes are gonna be heads one, heads two, heads three, heads four, heads five, heads six. That's six outcomes. And then tails one, tails two, tails three, tails four, tails five, tails six. That's six more outcomes. And so we get 12 outcomes. But the point is that we wanna be able to do this without listing them all. So then the multiplication rule will help us count when we don't have to wanna to list them all. All right, let's try the next one. Okay, in this example, it says you're gonna roll a die twice. Okay, so let's go ahead and write down some outcomes again. So if you roll a die twice, you're gonna get a number and then another number. So something like two, five is an outcome. That means the first roll was a two, second roll was a five. Remember, you have to roll the die twice to complete this experiment once. That means you have to give me two numbers to tell me one outcome. Give me another one. Uh, something like six, one, or three, three, or five, four. And anyway, there's lots of them. Okay, so I just want you to get comfortable with what the outcomes look like first. All right, so let's, let's count how many outcomes there are total. So again, I'll put number of things in the sample space. So you tell me, in order to make up an outcome such as this, how many decisions do you have to make? We well, have to tell me two numbers. So you make, up, you make two decisions. You decide what number to say first and you decide what number to say second. So two blank spaces because it's two decisions. All right, so now tell me, how many choices did you have for your first decision? Your first decision, you had to give me a number for what the first die landed on. You have six choices for that, because it could be one, two, three, four, five, or six. So you put a six here. Okay, then how many choices do you have for the second decision? For the second decision, you're gonna tell me what the second die landed on. Again, you have six choices for that. It could be anything, one, two, three, four, five, or six. So you multiply and you get 36. What if you were gonna roll five dice instead of two dice? Well then, an outcome would look something like uh, five, two, three, three, six. That would be one outcome if you're rolling five dice. So take five, if I asked you to count 
how many outcomes you have, it would take five decisions. So you have to tell me how many choices you have for the first decision. Six choices, since the first die can land on one, two, three, four, five, or six. Six choices for the second, six choices for all of them. And you multiply all those together to get how many outcomes you have for that, um, that experiment. Now let me go ahead and calculate the answer real quick. And the answer is 7,776 different outcomes. Now I'm not going to put that in a box because that's not what this question asked, but just wanted to generalize it. So if you roll any amount of dice, you can figure out how many different outcomes there are. Okay, let's try the next one. Okay, in this example, we're going to draw three cards from a deck one by one with replacements. So again, I want to write down some outcomes. So it could be, so we're drawing three cards, so it could be something like King of Hearts, Queen of Diamonds, Three of Spades. That's one outcome there. Again, you got to tell me what three cards you drew. So we drew those three cards. Okay, another example could be Four of Diamonds, Five of Diamonds, Nine of Clubs. It does say that we're drawing with replacement. That means we can get the same card more than once. So it could be something like Two of Hearts, Oops, for the first card, and then two hearts for the second card, two of hearts for the third card. And anyway, there's lots of them. So you can get the same card showing up more than once in that situation there. It came up three times, the same card three times, but it could be same card twice. Anyway, because we're drawing with replacement. So if I want to count how many there are total, how many different outcomes total, we'll call that the number of things in the sample space. How many decisions does it make? I'm sorry, how many decisions does it take to give me one outcome? It takes three decisions. Because you gotta tell me what card you drew first, what card you drew second, what card you drew third. So three blank spaces. How many choices do you have for what to say first? The first card can be any card in the deck, so you have 52 choices for that first decision. What about the second card? Well, when you go to draw the second card, or when you go to tell me what the second card is, it could be any card in the deck, including the first card. It can be any card. So 52 again, because there's 52 cards in a deck. How many choices do you have for the third decision? The third card can be any card again. So 52 again. All right, so let's calculate that. And the answer is 140,608 outcomes. That's a lot of outcomes. Okay, so you see why it's important that we're able to count without listing them all. If we had to list them all first and then count them, oh my God, 140,000. That's a lot to list. But if I only want to know how many there are, then you can use this counting rule to figure out how many there are. Okay, let's try the next example. Okay, this example is almost the same as example four, except, except it says we're drawing without replacement. So what that means is when we go to draw, we're going to draw three cards still, but when we go to draw the second one, we have not put the first one back. When I go to draw the third one, we haven't put the first or second one back. So that means you're not going to see any cards show up more than once. So I'm going to write down some outcomes. So the ones we had in the last example, most of them were okay, except for the last one we had, but let me just write some new ones. So seven of hearts, let's say king of diamonds, Ace of Spades, so just a sequence of three cards there, or Nine of Clubs, Eight of Clubs, Three of Hearts. Um, something like Two of Diamonds, Eight of Clubs, Two of Diamonds is not an example of an outcome of this because you can't get the Two of Diamonds twice. Because once, you've, once you tell me Two of Diamonds, that card is out of the deck. You can't get it again. So let me go ahead and x this out this is not an example of an outcome of this experiment but this would have that example there would have been an example of the experiment in example four but anyway there's lots of examples okay so then if i want to count how many outcomes there are total once again first ask yourself in order to make up one of these objects in order to, in order to make up an outcome how many decisions do you have to make the answer is you have to make three decisions because you have to tell me three cards. So I'll put three blank spaces here. How many options do you have for your first decision? 
Your first decision is to tell me what card you want to say first, and it can be any card in the deck. So this is 52. There's 52 different ways to make that first decision. Now is where it becomes a little bit different than the last example. When you tell me your second card, when you're trying to build an alchemy, tell me your second card. The second card cannot be the card you said the first time. So once you've said the first card, you have you don't have 52 options for your second card. You have 51 options because it can't be the card you said first. What about for the third card? Well, once you've decided, once you've made your first two decisions, you've told me the first card and you told me the second card in your outcome, and you're going to make up the third one. The third one can't be what you said first, and it can't be what you said second. Otherwise, it could be anything. So that leaves 50 cards for what, how many options you have for your third decision. Okay, and then you just multiply those to see how many outcomes we have. And that is 132,600 outcomes. All right, let's try the next one. Okay, so in this experiment, we're gonna draw two balls from the bag on the right there, one by one with replacement. Okay, once again, before we count all the different things in the sample space, I wanna write down some outcomes so we can get comfortable with what the outcomes look like. So drawing two balls from the bag, one by one with replacement. So outcomes are things like, okay, if you're drawing two, something like two, eight, that's one outcome, it means you drew two on the first draw and eight on the second draw. You could have something like 10, three. Oh, that doesn't look good. Putting a 10 next to a three like that might be a little bit confusing. So maybe I'll put a dash between them. So the first one is two, eight, second one is 10, three. Okay, so that 10, three means um, 10 on the first draw, three on the second one. Since we're drawing with replacement though, you could get the same ball twice. You can get something like seven, seven, or like four, four, but they don't have to be the same. It's gonna be something like four, one. And anyway, there's lots of outcomes here. Okay, so you look at those outcomes and then I'm gonna ask you, okay, how many decisions do you have to make in order to give me one of those, in order to build one of those? How many decisions? And then we'll count how many different outcomes there are total in the sample space. So in order to give me one outcome, you got to tell me two numbers. That means you got to make two decisions. You have to decide what number to say first, and then you have to decide what number to say second. Since it takes two decisions, two blank spaces. Okay, how many choices do you have for what number to say first? Well, the first number can be any number from 1 to 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 10. So you got 10 choices for what to say first. Okay, then how many choices do you have for what to say second? Well, when you, once you've made your first choice, whatever number you say, you're going to put that number back in the bag before you draw again. So the second number could be the same as the first number. The second number can be any number from 1 to 10 again. So you have 10 choices for what to say second. And so that means there's 100 different outcomes here. Okay, that's how that one goes. Let's go to the next one. This one is basically the same as the last one except this time we're drawing without replacement. So since we're drawing without replacement, it just means that after we draw the first ball, when we go to draw again, we can't get that same one again because it's been removed from the bag and we're not putting it back in. Okay, so let me once again write down some outcomes. So, an example of an outcome is something like three, five. Again, what I mean there is first ball was a three, second ball was a five. That's one outcome there. Okay, so I know it's two numbers, but to finish this experiment, you have to draw two balls. So you draw two balls, you get one outcome. So there's one outcome. Another outcome, something like eight, nine. Here's something that's not an outcome, like two, two. That is definitely not an outcome of this because we're drawing with replacement. So if the first number is two, the second one can't be two. So I'm gonna X that out. That is not an outcome of this experiment. But as long as the two numbers are different, it's totally an outcome. So something like six, three, and on and on we go. All right, now let's count how many outcomes there are total without listing them all. So how many outcomes total? How many things are in a sample space? So tell me, how many decisions does it take 
to give me one of these outcomes. Just like the last example, it takes two decisions. You got to tell me two numbers. How many choices do you have for the first number? The first number can be any number in the bag. So you got 10 choices for the first number. This time, the second part's a little different though. Once you've made your first decision, and you've told me what number came out of the bag first, that number cannot be set again. So the second number can be any number except for the one you said first. So how many choices do you have for the second number? Nine. And that's it. So then you multiply. So 10 times nine, so 90. So there's 90 different outcomes of this experiment. All right, so let's go ahead and look at uh, some other examples. Okay, Greg Sandwich Shop. So here's a story with my sandwich shop. I own a sandwich shop. When you come to my sandwich shop, you're gonna build a sandwich and you have to build it in a very specific way and that's it. So you have to choose a bread. Your choices are white or sourdough, that's it. If you don't want bread or if you want some other kind of bread, get out, you can't have it. Okay, you only have those two choices, white or sourdough. Then the next step in order to build the sandwich at my shop is you're gonna pick a meat. At my sandwich shop, there are three choices for the meat you could choose. So chicken, turkey, or roast beef. If you don't like any of those meats, you want a different meat or you're vegetarian or you want two meats, too bad, get out. My sandwich shop, you can only choose one meat. You choose one bread and one meat, and then you choose one cheese. And here are your options here for the cheese. So you gotta choose American cheddar, provolone, or Swiss. You can't choose more than one cheese. You can't say I want provolone and Swiss, or you can't say I don't like cheese, don't put any cheese. If you wanna do that, you get out. You want condiments, mayo, ketchup, um, whatever you'd, extra thing you'd add to your sandwich. You can't have that, get out, go to another sandwich shop. Okay, so that's how my sandwich shop works. Okay, you pick the bread, one bread only, pick the meat, one meat only, pick the cheese, one cheese only, and then you go away. All right, so now that we understand that, it says list a few sandwiches that can be made at my sandwich shop. Okay, so let me go ahead and list a couple. So one thing you could do is you can choose white bread, and then chicken, and then American cheese. I'm just gonna use the first letter of each thing. So that says, that's white bread, chicken sandwich on American with American cheese. Um, I want you to notice that I didn't put wheat bread in there because if I put white and wheat, then it'd be harder to write because if I use W, you're gonna be confused, is it white or wheat? But on the other hand, if you look at, um, there's chicken for the meat and there's cheddar for the cheese, and they both start with C, but that's not gonna cause confusion. If I put a C second, then it's gotta be chicken. If the C would have been third, then it would have to be cheddar. Okay, so that's not a problem there. Okay, let's go ahead and list a couple more examples. So, and come up with your own. So something like sourdough, roast beef, and Swiss. Again, those S's won't cause confusion because the first S is for the bread, the last S is for the, the cheese. Let's do one more example. Let's do sourdough, uh, turkey, and cheddar. Oops, I don't want commas here. Sourdough, turkey, cheddar. And on and on we go. We can make lists. We can list all the sandwiches like this if we wanted to. But I just want you to list a couple so you can see what's going to go on here. In the next part of this example, I'm going to ask you to count how many sandwiches can be made at my sandwich shop total. How many different sandwiches? So I'm going to ask you um, how many decisions does it take to build a sandwich at my sandwich shop and it takes three decisions. You gotta tell me three letters. You gotta tell me what bread you're choosing, what meat you're choosing, and what cheese you're choosing. Okay, so to figure out how many sandwiches that can be made at my sandwich shop, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna call this absolute value of S. Think of S as the sample space, which would be the list of all the sandwiches that can be made at my shop. And absolute value of S is how many of those sandwiches are there. So one more time, how many decisions does it take to build such a sandwich? It takes three decisions. The first one is you have to decide what bread. The second decision is you decide what meat you want. The third decision is to decide what cheese you want. Okay, so I know how many blank spaces to put. Now, how many choices do you have for the bread? You have two choices, so you put a two here. Then you count how many choices do you have for your second decision for choosing the meat? 
you have three choices. Once in a while, I get students write four there because they say roast beef and they think that's two words. So one, two, three, four, but it's not like that. Chicken is one, turkey is one, roast beef is another. So just be careful on that. So there's three different meats. Okay, then the third step is to choose the cheese. How many choices do you have for that? You have four, so you put a four here. Then you multiply all those and you get 24. So there's 24 different sandwiches that you can make at my sandwich shop. All right, let's look at the next part. This one says, how many different sandwiches can be made at Greg's Sandwich Shop that have chicken in them? Okay, you know S stands for sample space. It's a list of all the outcomes, in this case, all the sandwiches. So, but they're asking me to count a certain group of sandwiches, which is an event, it's a list. It's a list of not all the outcomes, but some of them. So real quick, I wanna make a letter for that. So we're gonna use C is gonna be the event that the sandwich has chicken in it. In other words, think of it as the list of all the sandwiches that have chicken in it, as opposed to the list of just all the sandwiches, which would be the sample space. So then here, they're asking you to find absolute value of C. How many things are in this event? Again, I could make the list, but I don't wanna make a list. I wanna do the counting without making a list. So how many decisions does it take to build a sandwich that has chicken in it? Okay, there might be some confusion. Some people might say three, some people might say two. I feel like the easiest way is to make it three for all things, and then the numbers will change depending on what you're counting. So I'm gonna say it takes three decisions. You have to choose the bread, choose the meat, and choose the cheese. All right, how many choices do you have for the meat? I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. How many choices do you have for your first decision for the bread? You have two choices. But now for the second decision, you gotta choose the meat, but since we're counting only chicken sandwiches, how many choices do you have for what meat goes in the sandwich? One choice, it's gotta be chicken. Okay, and then how many choices do you have for the, th the third decision for the cheese? You have four choices there, multiply, and you get eight. So there's eight chicken sandwiches. 24 sandwiches can be made at my shop total. Eight of them have chicken in it. Okay, let's look at the next part. This part says, if a sandwich is selected from Greg's Sandwich Shop at random, what is the probability that it has chicken in it? This question is asking you to find a probability, which is the point. That's the whole point for us talking about counting. Um, okay, so imagine it like this. I want you to imagine that I went to my sandwich shop and I made every possible sandwich that could be made. I made one of each possible sandwich that can be made and I put them in a bag and I'm gonna draw one from the bag at, at random. So I put my hand in the bag and I'm gonna draw one and I wanna know what's the probability that I draw one that has chicken in it. Okay, so the notation for this would be probability that I get one that has chicken in it. C is what we stood, what we, used for the sandwich having chicken in it. As far as the probability notation, um, we're gonna use the absolute value formula here. This is absolute value of C over absolute value of S. The top number is how many chicken sandwiches that can be made at my sandwich shop. And the bottom is how many sandwiches can be made total. So the top number was eight. There was eight chicken sandwiches that can be made at my shop. And there was 24 that can be made total. So that's the answer to that. If I put my hand in the bag, there's eight chicken sandwiches in there, 24 total. So I have an eight over 24 chance of drawing a sandwich that's a chicken sandwich. All right, that's how that example goes. I hope the picture of the sandwich over here helped. It felt like it put you in the mood, maybe get you hungry, maybe now you want a sandwich. All right, let's go ahead and look at one more example. All right, example nine. How many seven character license plates can be made where the second, third, and fourth characters are letters and the rest are numbers? You might go, Greg, what are you talking about? Okay, most license plates have seven things on there. The things on there, I'm gonna call characters. The reason I'm calling them characters is because some are letters, some are numbers. So I don't wanna say it has seven numbers because some of them are letters. I don't wanna say seven letters, so I'm gonna say seven characters. So it could be a character or a number. Now, why did I write it like this? Because oftentimes in California, on California license plates, the second, third, and fourth characters are letters, but the rest are numbers, so it's a number, three letters and a number, like I have in this picture here. I found this picture online. Hopefully it's not anybody's license plate that we know. But anyway, see how it works? There's a number, then three letters, then three numbers. 
I'm not saying license plates are always like this, but we're going to count license plates that look like this. So I felt like the fastest way to write that down is um, count all the license plates where the second, third, and fourth are letters, the rest are numbers. Okay, so there's an example of an outcome of a license plate like that. And if you're going to make up an example of a license plate like that, how many decisions would you have to make to make up an example like that? The answer is you'd have to make seven decisions because there's seven characters. So you have to decide what character to say first, what character to say second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Okay, so to figure out how many license plates there are total, I'm going to use S for sample space, all license plates like this total. It takes seven decisions, so seven blank spaces. How many choices do you have for the first character? Well, the first character has to be a number, right? This has to be a number here. So it can be anything. It can be zero. Don't forget zero. A lot of times people forget zero. It can be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's 10 choices. So you have 10 choices for what can go there. Times. The second character has to be a letter. So it could be any of the 26 letters, A through Z. So 26 there. What about the third one? The third one has to be a letter. See, set letter here. Third one's got to be a letter. Again, it can be any of the 26 letters. So 26 here. How many choices do you have for the next character? Again, the next character has to be a letter again. So it can be any of the 26 letters. And the last three characters are all numbers. And so each one of them can be any number from zero to, to nine. 0 and then 1 through 9, that's 10 numbers. So there's 10 choices for what you can say there, 10 choices for what you can say there, and 10 choices for what you can see, say there. So you multiply all these things. Let's see what we get here. And I'm getting 1, 7, 5, 7, 6, 0, 0, 0, 0. 1, 7, 5, 7, 6, 0, 0, 0, 0. That is 175 million license plates like that. So if all California license plates are like that, and as long as we have less than 175 million people in California, we're not going to run out. So that's good to know. All right. So that's the first one there. So let's look at the next example. Okay, so we're still counting license plates. How many seven character license plates can be made where the second, third, and fourth characters are letters and the rest are numbers? That part is exactly what it said in the last example. Then it says, and no repetition is allowed. If you look at the license plate on the last slide, you saw we saw the letter B a couple times. I think it was B. Um, so anyways, you see the same letter more than once. You see the same number more than once. That's what I mean by repetition. So if I say no repetition is allowed, I mean every number, there's going to be four numbers. All four numbers are going to be different numbers, and the three letters are all going to be different letters. You never see the same character more than once. Okay, so I want to give a name for this event. So let me call it NR. That's going to stand for the event that the license plate. You can call it anything you want, but I'm going to call it NR for no repetition. The license plate has no repetition. In its characters. Okay, and then I can use this notation, then I'm counting how many such license plates there are. How many decisions does it take to make such a license plate? It takes seven decisions again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's seven blank spaces. In the first decision, you have to decide what number to say first, and that number can be any number, 0 to 9. That's 10 choices. The second thing has to be a letter, can be any letter, so you have 26 choices for the second one. Now it gets a little bit different. The next choice here is a letter. So you're going to put a letter here, but the letter you put here cannot be the letter that you put there, because you can't have repetition. So once you've decided on the letter, this next spot here can't have, so you can't have the letter that you put in, in decision two. So decision three has only 25 choices. Okay. Then the next character has to be a letter. So this has to be a letter. But 
the previous decisions you made, you picked the letter here and you picked the letter here. The letter I put here now cannot be this, the one you put here or the one you put there. So you only have 24 choices for what to put here. Okay, then the next character is going to be a number. So what you put here is going to be a number, but we picked one other number way back over here. So the one you put here cannot be the one you put here. So how many choices do you have for that? You have nine choices now. Okay, how about the next character? The next character is a number again. So whatever you're going to put here, it can't be any of the previous numbers you picked. We picked a number here, we picked a number here. So even though there would be 10 options, you can't pick the number that you put in, in your first decision or in your fifth decision. So you only have eight choices now for what number to put there. All right, what about the last spot? The last spot is a number again. And you, so this spot here is a number, but you can't put the number you chose over here. Can't put the number you chose over here or over here. So how many numbers are there left? There's seven numbers left. So seven choices for that last decision. Okay, so then you just multiply all that out. Let's see what this is. And when you count all that, when you multiply it all out, you get seven, eight, seventy-eight million six hundred twenty-four thousand. So there's that many license plates that don't have any repetition in their characters. Okay, let's go ahead and look at part C. How many seven character license plates can be made where the second, third, and fourth characters are letters, the rest are numbers? So that all just says, again, the type of license plates that we've been focusing on the whole time. But then it says the letters can repeat, but the numbers cannot. Okay, so again, I want to have a symbol for this event here. So I'm going to call this NRN. That stands for the event that the license plate has no repetition. in its numbers. So the letters can repeat, but the numbers can't repeat. Now that I have a symbol for that event, again, you can just call it A or something if you don't like the notation I'm using, but I'm writing it like this so I can remember what it stands for. NRN, no repetition in the numbers. Okay, so how many decisions does it take to build such a license plate? Take seven decisions, so seven blank spaces. The license plate has seven characters. It's always going to take seven decisions. Okay, the first decision you're going to make is what number to say first. Remember that you can say any of the numbers zero through nine, so we have ten choices there. Okay, the second one is going to be a letter. can be any of the 26 letters in the alphabet, so 26 there. What about the third one? Well, the third one is going to be a letter, and it could be any letter because we can have repetition in the letters. Okay, so letters can repeat. So this is 26 again, 26 choices. The next one is a letter. And again, letters can repeat. So this is 26 choices. So for the letters, it's 26 every time because you can use the same letter more than once. So we keep drawing from a bag of 26 letters if you want. Now the next one, this spot here is going to be a number. The numbers cannot repeat. So we made a decision over here where we picked a number. So this one here cannot be that number. So we have nine choices here. Okay. The next spot is a number. So when you make the decision here, you're going to pick a number because the numbers can't repeat. You can't pick the number you picked here or the number you picked here. So your 10 choices goes down to eight now. Okay. Let's go to the last one. The last character is also a number. So when you make the decision for what number to say here, that number cannot be this or this, or this. In other words, it can't be the numbers you picked in decision one, in decision five, or decision six. It can be any other number though, so it gives you seven options still. Okay, remember the numbers can't repeat. The letters can, but the numbers can't. All right, so then you just multiply that out to figure out how many license plates of the sort you have. So let's multiply this out. Okay. 
And I'm getting, let's see if I get this right, 26, 9, 8, 7, 10. Yeah. Okay. So it looks like we have 88 million. 583,040 license plates with no repetition in the numbers. All right, let's look at the next part. Okay, now it's asking for a probability. What is the probability? Remember, that's the whole reason we're counting, is to figure out probabilities. What's the probability that a randomly selected seven character license plate where the second, third, and fourth characters are letters and the rest are numbers has no repetition in the characters? All right. Think about it like this. Can you imagine that I built every possible license plate, whether there's repetition or not, and put them in a bag? If it helps you, think about the little tiny license plates. They used to be keychains. I don't know if you remember. Um, but imagine every single one. It was something like 175 million something, whatever, license plates. All of those are in a bag. And now I'm going to put my hand in there, and I'm asking if you draw from that bag, What's the probability you get one that has no repetition in the characters? Okay, so the notation for this would be probability that you have no repetition in the characters. NR is what we used for no repetition in the characters. So no repetition at all. What's the probability if you draw one of these license plates, you don't see repetition at all in the numbers or the letters? Okay, we're going to use the absolute value formula for this. So it's like this. And we counted these things already. So let me just go ahead and write the answer. Um, no repetition was, um, let's see if I can find no repetition. All right. So it looks like the number of things, the number of license plates that had no repetition in the characters at all was 78,624,000. And the number of license plates total was 175 million. 760,000. So that's the answer to that one. You can simplify it or put it as a decimal. If you're dying to know what that is as a percentage, that's fine. Okay, let's look at the next part. Again, what is the probability? They're asking us for a probability. The randomly selected seven character license plate where the second, third, and fourth characters are letters and the rest are numbers has no repetition in the numbers. So we just counted the ones that have no repetition in the numbers. So once again, think of it like this. I have a bag with every possible license plate in there, whether there's repetition or not, all possible. And I'm going to put my hand in the bag and I'm going to draw one. And now I'm asking, what's the probability I get one that has no repetition in the numbers? Repetition in the letters is okay. So this time, so no repetition in the numbers. So they're asking us for a probability of the other event, no repetition in the numbers. I'm going to use the absolute value formula for this. It's absolute value of no repetition in the numbers divided by absolute value of S. And we counted these already, so I just put the answers down. No repetition in the numbers was 88,583,040. And how many license plates total? 175,760,000, like that. And that's the answer. All right, so that's the end of the story on probability and counting. Guys, I hope this video was very helpful.